Okay. Last time here, Greg Davis, founder of D3 Energy, and welcome back to the D3 Energy live stream. And had a little technical difficulties with somebody asking me for directions and instructions. So we'll see if we can keep this one going. So I am going to maybe be repeating myself for some of you all who had been listening and I appreciate your patience. So continuing on with the series that I have been posting about the legends in our oil and gas industry, the pioneers, the visionaries who paved the way for America's energy dominance and America's energy superiority today. Why we have so much oil and gas in our country today. It was these legends that I have been sharing about the past several videos who were the pioneers of our oil and gas industry. I shared with you about the Wildcatters in Texas and Patillo Higgins and Captain Lucas who were credited, who found the largest oil and gas field in America, the Spindletop Gusher in the 1900s. And then I shared with you about H.L. Hunt who is credited with finding the largest oil and gas field in America that's still producing today, the East Texas oil field back in the 1930s. And I also shared with you that H.L. Hunt was an acquaintance of my grandfather and my father who gave my father his initial inspiration and business advice on how to be successful in the oil and gas business. And today I'm going to share about my father, Marvin Davis, who I had the great pleasure, of course, getting to work for and work with and get to learn what I have learned. He instilled and passed on his wisdom and his enthusiasm to me and to others for all those who worked for him. And why is this important? And I'll wrap it up at the end and tell you, but I'm gonna tell you the story about the Jonah oil field and it's fields like that and many others that we are developing today in the United States with new technology that were first discovered, that were first pioneered by people like my father and HL and others that I'm going to continue to share for the next couple of videos. I'll get to that one shortly. So Davis Oil Company was the first oil and gas company. It was founded by my grandfather and then built by my father Marvin Davis. My grandfather was Jack Davis and Jack Davis came over from England. He was an immigrant from Liverpool, England and he immigrated in the early 1900s to New York. And there he got into the clothing business. Specifically, he got into the dress business. And <clears throat> he started a company called J-Day Dress. And J-Day Dress Company made dresses for the five and dime stores, uh, stores like Woolworths, Pennies, and others. And they sold dresses on the cheap, $5 a copy. And my grandfather built that to be, you know, a thriving business. He was a bit of a gambler and he was also an investor. And my father got his inspiration from my grandfather. My grandfather was this eternal optimist and he would bet on anything and invest on any, in anything. As background, my grandfather Jack was a professional boxer and fought more than a hundred fights, a hundred fights, um, and actually fought for the light heavyweight championship of the world. 
and he got to know a lot of people, very colorful man. They called him Englishman Jack Davis, and my father obviously got to spend a lot of time with him. And my grandfather would meet a lot of people, and he met H.L. Hunt at, his, at an early age, and others, and my grandfather liked to invest in things, and one of the things he invested in was uh, a fabric which many of you know of today. Some guys came to him with an idea. They said, hey, we have this fabric that won't wrinkle. You never need to iron it. You can just throw it in your suitcase and travel and pull it out and put it on, and it would uh, not wrinkle. You'd never have to bother with it. So my grandfather invested in that factory, and that was Seersucker. So my grandfather was one of the earliest first investors in the fabric known as Seersucker. And my, my father got to see all this, but he really did not like the clothing business. And my grandfather invested in some oil deals in Evansville, Indiana. And when he did, he asked my father to go check on him. And when my father went out there, he absolutely was inspired and fell in love with the oil business. Because I remember him telling me with glee early on, when he would talk about the oil business and talk about you know, how exciting it was, he said, you know, when I saw that oil coming out of the ground, bubbling out of the ground, he was hooked. And then when he went back to New York and he saw H.L. Hunt, and he talked to H.L. Hunt about that, as the story goes, he got his initial advice from H.L. Hunt that said, son, the man who drills the most wells has the best chance of finding the most oil. And my father took that to heart. So my father started working in the business and he wanted to grow the business. And so they went looking for an area, he went looking for an area that he could drill a lot of wells. He didn't know how he was going to drill a lot of wells because it was a very risky business at the time. The chance of finding oil and gas at the time were 1 in 20. One well out of 20 wells would come up dry. And so he tried to figure out how was he going to do this. But he had to find an area to drill in that he had free reign. And at the time, places like Texas had limits on how much oil and gas that could be produced, called proration. And so he settled on the Rockies. And he and my mom moved to Denver in the early 1950s and, and started building Davis Oil Company. So then he tried to figure out, okay, how am I going to drill all these wells with this kind of risk? because back then you weren't buying production, you were just drilling for oil. And so he came up with the idea, what if I secure the land, hire the best and brightest oil finders, and put those deals together, those projects, those prospects as we call them, and then find investors for that. And what he found is there was a great appetite for investing in oil and gas wells, because oil and gas was a very, very exciting industry, and a lot of people wanted to get in. And so my father hired the best and brightest geologists, engineers, landmen. He put up all the money to secure the land in these areas, and they developed prospects, and then they brought those prospects two investors. And he pioneered what is known today, which is the standard deal today, called the third for a quarter deal. And what is the third for a quarter deal? The third for a quarter deal is this. So a company, Davis Oil Company, would spend all the money to hire the geologists, get all the information, buy the leases, buy the land, design the well bores. They would sink those hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, 
into that prospect area. And then they would go to investors and they would offer this deal. If the investor wanted in, they would pay one third of the cost of a well to earn 25% or one quarter of the interest. So the investor would pay one third of the cost of the well and the cost of the land. And when they drilled that well, they would have one quarter of the interest. And if that well was successful, Davis Oil Company, its investors would then pay their proportionate share of finishing that well. And thus Davis Oil would have the 25% interest. What that allowed, and the industry adopted that. Today that business model still exists. So my father was credited with that business model. And it's the standard today. Sometimes there's deviations. And with that business model, he started buying land, developing prospects, growing, and by the 1970s became one of the largest explorers in the United States. And I'll be posting some articles that I have from those days that talk about his success. During the 1970s and through, through the 1970s and into the early 1980s, Davis Oil Company drilled more than 10,000 wells, finding hundreds of millions of barrels of oil and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. And became the fourth largest explorer in the United States behind multinationals like Exxon, Shell, and Amoco. I had the great fortune of going to work for my father in 1977. He basically told me, he said, you're coming to work and you're gonna be an oil man. And I didn't know much about the oil business. I didn't, I had gone to the office with him and spent time and got to meet the guys. And uh, they were amazing, these salt of the earth oil finders who, there wasn't real technology at the time. It was just their intuition, their interpretation, their creativity interpreting the earth to find places. But they had my father who was inspiring them and who was encouraging them and paying for them to go find this oil and gas. And he would give them all a piece of those wells. So these guys had this incredible enthusiasm. They loved working for my father. And so I got to go to work for him at an early age at 13 and basically got to train with all these great oil finders. He said, you're gonna go work with the geologists, the engineers, you're gonna learn everything about the business and then you're also gonna sit with me and I'm gonna show you how I make deals and let you meet everybody. And it was amazing. I asked one of his employees, one of his great employees who actually did, still does work today, a fellow named Mark Goldberg, what was the key to his success? How did he do it? I mean, I have my opinions, but I remember him saying, that he and others who worked at Davis Oil in those days, my father would come in a room and he would just exude enthusiasm, excitement. He, he always empowered everybody. He always made everybody feel like they knew what they were doing because he would tell them, look, I brought you in because you're the best, you're the brightest, you're the smartest, and we're gonna find oil together and let's go and let's go get them. He would exude this enthusiasm and this energy, which I, I remember that, you know, all through my years living and working with him. And that's really the key to his success because he would encourage his, his guys. Yeah, they would drill a dry hole, but his motto, if you drilled a dry hole, was, all right, what's next? What's our next well? He would brush off a dry hole like, you know, him changing lanes in a car. I mean, he just, it didn't matter, okay? Because he knew the business had dry holes and his geologists would get discouraged and he would say, all right, what's your next deal? He would say that to me, oh, we drilled a dry hole. Okay, what's next, what's next? 
And that was the key to success, his enthusiasm. So as I said, through all those years, through the 70s and 80s, Davis Oil grew to be one of the biggest oil producers. And in 1980 through 1983, in a series of three different sales, my father sold his oil production. He had an instinct. At that time, the industry was on fire. People were predicting that oil would go to 60, 70, 80 dollars a barrel. To go back, some of the first oil that my father found was at two dollars, three dollars, four dollars a barrel. And by the early 1980s, 79.80 oil had gone to 30, 40, 50 dollars, 30, 40, 50 dollars a barrel, or was headed there. And people in the industry and investors and the Wall Street thought it's just going to keep going up and up and up. But my father, who always told me, love your family, love your country, love your religion, love your community, but don't fall in love with your assets, okay? Don't fall in love with your assets. And if things are going really well and the market is going up and up and up, that's the time to look to sell. And so in 1980, he had multiple oil companies come to him saying they wanted to buy his oil. And oil was headed up, you know, 30, 35, 40 dollars a barrel. And at the time, America thought the oil, the industry, uh, America's oil reserves are going to run out. And so everybody was excited. So in a series of three sales, he sold his oil and gas production and totaling about $870 million. And an amazing sale at the time. And from that point, and it was not long after that, that oil prices collapsed. That OPEC essentially said, all right, we're gonna flood the market with oil and we wanna crush the American oil and gas industry. And that's essentially what they did. They just did it recently, they did it back then. And as I've said, America was beholden to other countries for its energy destiny. And he took that money and he took that entrepreneurial spirit and that bravado and he went to Hollywood and bought into the movie industry. Fox Studios went into real estate and golf courses, Pebble Beach, Aspen, Beverly Hills Hotel, and went on and did many other things. And I had the great, you know, the great fortune of getting to work with him in many of those businesses. And so, why is this important? Well, of course, he's my father, and I loved him, and I love him today. And I couldn't have had a better mentor, a better teacher, a better inspiration for what I'm doing today. And many people will say the same thing, the people who work for him. Many of them I know today are still alive today, and some I'm actually working with, and many others in the industry who are out there, especially in the conventional oil and gas industry. They come to me and tell me stories about my father all the time. Why does it matter? As I've been talking about, there is this resurgence today in conventional oil and gas. And America is hydrocarbon dominant. And we're going to continue this dominance because through this technology revolution, this shale revolution, you know, America now is producing more oil and gas than we ever have. And our power on the world energy stage is unparalleled at this point and we're going to keep going and added to adding to this shale revolution is this resurgence in conventional which i and many others are now seeing the opportunity to take new technology new technologies in drilling and completion and imaging and data processing and applying it to these conventional reservoirs, to these conventional areas, and combining that with the great minds that still exist today, the pioneers and the prodigies of the pioneers, many of these oil and gas folks that work for people like my father and Hunt and many others who still have this knowledge of 
where that oil and gas is, but they just didn't have the technology. It's because of pioneers like my father who drilled these early wells, many cases the first well in a particular area. Uh, you know, Midland is on fire right now producing so much oil and gas, and I'll be talking about some of the original pioneers out there, but back in the early 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, visionaries like my father drilled in those areas conventionally with the low tech, the tech they had at the time. And now today the industry is going back with the technology to these areas where people like my father drilled and finding vast resources and more oil and gas resources, which is why we have so much oil and gas production today. So let me tell you a little story, an example of how pioneers like my father opened the door for the next huge amount of oil and gas back in 1979 and 1980 up in Wyoming. Davis Oil Company drilled a well called the number one Wardell Federal. This is out in Sublet County, Wyoming. Near an area, um, you know, it was very remote at the time. And they drilled a well and it made some gas, but it wasn't economic. It was you know, using the technology of the time, it wasn't economic. They did some stimulation on the reservoirs that were in the earth there and got a modest amount of gas and it produced, but not you know a wildly economic venture. And then my father, Davis Oil, sold those wells in one of those big transactions to a company called Home Petroleum which I had the great fortune of being there when my father signed that deal. I still have the pen from that deal, and I remember it greatly, but they had bought all of, majority of his oil, but they bought that one well as well, the number one Wardell Federal. Then they took that and drilled a couple more wells and got some very modest gas production, but nothing to write home about. In the early 1990s, a company went back in to those wells and they started drilling around those wells because they had some new technology called fracking and they drilled a couple wells around there and suddenly had huge volumes of oil and gas that those wells became what's known as the Jonah oil field today which is estimated to have 10 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It's still producing today. Huge, huge field. And it was discovered because of those original wells that were drilled by my father and a couple more after that drilled those discovery wells. And if I'll post some articles about that field and it'll talk about Davis Oil and, and then Home Petroleum drilling those subsequent wells that set up that field. It's there because of this new technology. And we have that technology to deploy back into more places like that. More places like that, like has been happening in Midland, on the Permian, the Bakken, where Harold Hamm has gone, the Eagleford trend, the Marcellus trend. And America is now, again, because of those early days, those original wells, those, those men who went in there and drilled those wildcat wells, we now have so much oil and gas and we have more to get today. So that's the story of my father and uh, I appreciate you taking time. I know I took a little more time today than uh, normal because it's my favorite topic, <laughs> my father. I loved him very much, love him today. And um, so I appreciate you all taking time today to be with me. And I'm gonna continue on this week and talk about a couple other of the great conventional oil pioneers that paved the way for this revolution that we are in right now and that have set up this paradigm shift that is happening going back to conventional. We're gonna find more. I'll talk about them, and uh, I'll also be posting some written articles so you can read 
some of the stories and get some more color about my father and others. Thank you for taking time today. Please share this video with your friends. Join me, join us. Help us to continue America's energy dominance and help to build this, continue to build this paradigm shift towards conventional oil and gas. Thank you very much.